Welcome to CNB. I'm Siddharth Vinayak Patankar and this is one of those annual treats that we bring you. It is promising to be an absolute cracker. Yes, you've got a hint right next to me that uh, tells you why I say that. Let's get down to it now, shall we? The third generation BMW Z4 and the fifth generation Toyota Supra. Both compact two-seater sports cars, both important flagships for their brands. And even though you might think one comes from Germany and the other from Japan, you'd be wrong. They both actually come from Austria. Huh? What's that? Well, you see, both are built alongside each other by Magna Steyr under BMW's contract at its plant in Graz, Austria. And I believe this is a well-known fact. But for those of you who do not know, the two are then essentially the same, deep below the skin. BMW has developed the platform and drivetrain and produces the GR Supra based on the Z4 for Toyota. But they both look very different and also drive differently. They are definitely not twins then. And so I can go only so far as to call them step siblings. So while the exterior design and styling are rather obviously disparate, the Supra is a classic two-seater coupe while the Z4 stays true to form and has come back with the fabric folding top roof and so it's positioned as a roadster. The BMW has the brand's new form factor and large grille. Its face is aggressive and the top spec M40i gets the new very sporty M Sport style grille. There is no chrome and the effort is to keep things dark and menacing. The car's flanks and rear are also slim and lit. The whole impression is of a roadster which sits low to the ground with sharp lines and cuts along the metal. The tail lights are very sexy and in keeping with the kind of styling seen on other recent Bimmers like the 8 series. The GR Supra is a lot more evocative. The car looks a tad overstyled, with its face and bumper being a bit disproportionately large. The coupe roofline is swoopy and tucks in nicely to the taut rear. We have no legacy of the Supra nameplate in India, but it was always meant to be the humble, accessible sports car and therefore has legions of followers in places like the UK and Japan. But the new model has gone to being a bit pricier. Still, that does not matter to us right now, does it? Why then am I showing them to you? Well, the BMW Z4 is already available in India. And while it is no surprise addition to BMW's portfolio, I feel for Toyota, looking at bringing in a few units of the GR Supra could serve as a superb flagship and evoke huge emotion for the brand. Okay, but since these are sports cars, what about the performance? On the Z4, you have two engine options. There is the twin power turbo inline six cylinder range topper that makes 333 bhp and it's married to the Steptronic Sport transmission. The M Sport differential and adaptive M suspension are standard. The same spec makes around 368 bhp in other markets, but the detuning is keeping Indian conditions and fuel in mind. Now the M Sport differential and adaptive M suspension are only optional on the Z4 S Drive 20i which gets a 2.0-litre 4-cylinder heart. The output is 194 bhp and the car gets the same Steptronic transmission. Now remember how I told you that the technical side of the development is all BMW? Well, if you look under the hood of the GR Supra, you will find the BMW logo on many parts. 
The Supra uses the same BMW derived 3 litre engine but it has been detuned to make 329 bhp. The familiar BMW 8 speed gearbox though is also standard. Now there's a lot of talk about Toyota also getting the other two specs that I mentioned earlier that are on the Z4 that's likely to happen in 2021. The cars I tested were the stock GR Supra then and the meaner Z4 M40i. And I have to tell you that they aren't just different in looks and body style as I have been saying, they're absolutely different in terms of their character too. The GR Supra first. The GR Supra is a fun, frisky, slightly edgy car to drive. The first impression is that it will need you to get to know it a bit before you can push it very hard. The handling of the car is a tad nervous and yet it offers it a certain mechanical character that is largely absent in many sports cars these days. And yet the refinement is unmistakable. Okay, now time to put it in sport. unmistakable BMW-ness to this car and if you hadn't told me about the uh, cooperation between the two brands I would have probably said the car's character is BMW-like. Yes, it shines through very obviously. Yes, the GR Supra is definitely a playful coupe. Its mad character belies its BMW underpinnings and so while you can argue on the pros and cons of the Toyota tuning, it certainly feels like a two-seater coupe meant to bring a smile to your face. Now let's get to the Z4, shall we? The first thing here is obviously the fact that you can put that roof down. It makes the car fun in a whole different way. The wind, the sun, oh yes, all of this really works. But I have to say, the Toyota is a little bit crazier. Yes, the difference tuning can make becomes so evident straight away. The Z4 is precise and is a massive step up from its predecessor. The car will give you nothing to feel nervous about, no twitches, and instead goes about its duties in a clinical manner. So what it gives you in terms of performance perfection, it lacks a bit in terms of character. Strange, isn't it? And yet not. In a way, that is kind of how it should be. But the downside on the Bimmer is that it does not stand very far apart from its own stablemates, while the GR Supra is absolutely nothing like other Toyota badged cars. Okay, so with development largely done by BMW, that's again not surprising. I accept that. The BMW Z4 is the more relaxed, powerful and precise car to drive and will serve well on longer distances and on high-speed motorways. The GR Supra is more about being brash, show-offy and fun. The price difference between them is roughly between 10 and 14,000 US dollars depending on the trim and optional equipment. In India, the Z4 is priced between 66 and 80 and a half lakh rupees. Both give you optional paintwork, both have connectivity like Apple CarPlay, but the BMW gets the new iDrive 7.0 while the Supra makes do with the previous gen. 
and the Z4 will also offer things like the M Sport Dynamics that we talked about and both cars get goodies like the head-up display on the top trim only. Both have the same 2470mm wheelbase, so it is tight as a two-seater ought to be. The cabin on the Z4 is more plush and gives you a better sense of its width and space, naturally because of the roofless Roadster layout. The Toyota GR Supra feels a bit more cramped, yet is functional enough. Visibility around the A-pillars is a tad compromised. So which is the one to consider, were you in such a position? Well, if you want precision, no-nonsense performance and superb dynamics, the Z4 is the car for you. But then, shouldn't the very capable Porsche 718 Spyder also be on your shopping radar? The most spirited, fun and crazy ride is undoubtedly the Toyota GR Supra. It also costs less. And it gets all the good bits of the BMW with truckloads of character. And I go back to my initial statement that it could make for a very surprising, capable and fun flagship for the Toyota brand in India that, let's face it, currently lacks anything exhilarating or exciting, doesn't it? Will it happen? Unlikely. Should it? Uh, well, have you not been watching this and hearing what I've been saying? What do you do if you are the maker of iconic sports cars and then announce a mission to make an electric one? You go ahead and make a car that is just as sensational on performance as your fans would expect and oh, also make it all electric. That is the approach that the development of the Porsche Taycan seems to have taken and it is every bit a Porsche first and then happens to be an EV. It is also now the proud double title holder of the 2020 World Performance Car of the Year and the 2020 World Luxury Car. The Taycan was also a top three finalist for the World Car Design category and for many jurors, if it had qualified on criteria, it would have also won the World Car of the Year title. Yes, it is that good. Rewind a bit to the 2015 Frankfurt Motor Show when Porsche showed us the Mission E concept car. At the time, Porsche said it was aiming at producing the car with an output of around 590 bhp and a driving range of around 500 kilometers. The end result saw it get pretty darn close to that. The Porsche Taycan has impressed everyone who ever sat in it and I will explain why. Now there's four output versions of the Taycan and this one is the Turbo which is right up there. You do have the Turbo S which is even more powerful but I'll tell you what, 658 horses and 850 Nm of torque, that's plenty powerful. The Turbo S has 746 bhp by the way, before you ask. And yes, the numbers on the Taycan Turbo are also enviable anyway. The lower spec Taycans get 520 bhp. The thing with all electrics is the instant torque, but on the Taycan, it is just so much more than only that. The Taycan has two permanent magnet synchronous motors on each axle. The car's 800 volt battery is unlike most EVs that use 400 volt tech. 
it is housed in the underbody to give the car better driving dynamics. All-wheel drive is standard and helps with the car's drive modes, making it more or less dynamic depending on the requirement. The acceleration on this thing is absolutely insane! You just aren't ready for that kind of instant response. Frankly, even the internal combustion engine Porsches don't give you what this car can. Alright, let's do it again. And there's something very futuristic sounding about that battery response, the sound that you get when you're accelerating. Yeah, it's not a vroom, but somehow it seems to work. The Taycan is effortless to the point that is unbelievable. And there's a reason it accelerates like that. The Taycan gets a brand new automatically switching two-speed transmission on its rear axle. Porsche says it did this to vastly improve the car's dynamics. What this does is, gives you a really short ratio on the first gear, so your instant acceleration is lightning fast. The longer ratio on the second gear helps you to maintain acceleration when you are at higher speeds for quick reactions from the car. Oh, and it does 0 to 100 km per hour in 3 seconds. The Turbo S does it in 2.4 seconds, by the way. And you need to use the launch control for this. So it's bloody impressive on a straight highway. Yes, I can say that now. How does it handle? That's the next bit. The thing that you don't notice when you are driving the Taycan is that maximum output or the 658 horses is something you only get for two and a half seconds at a time. The reason? The engine management system doesn't want the electric drivetrain to overheat. So while it will give you brutal amounts of power, it does regulate just how much of it you get at any given time. The car uses Porsche's intelligent range manager too. That is basically onboard software that constantly adjusts throttle response, maximum speed and even the air conditioning when you start to run lower on battery power. This is effective when you have already input a destination in the car's navigation system. The downside of using the more effective and punchy 800 volt battery setup is finding a charging network for it. Porsche has developed a more powerful 270 kilowatt charger that can give you an 80% charge in 22 minutes, 30 seconds. There's a lot of talk at the time when the overall project was even announced by Porsche about, you know, can this company really get an electric sports car, right? And then there was a fair amount of criticism in terms of how long it took Porsche to bring it to market. Having spent a little bit of time with this car, what I can tell you is, boy was it time well spent. So yes, the Taycan deserves all the praise and accolades it's getting. The World Car Awards double win is just step one. The bigger win for Porsche is that the time and the money spent in the Taycan project will undoubtedly give us a slew of electrics and hybrids that will offer exhilarating performance and also allow the company to achieve the green targets it has set for itself over the coming years. The good news is that Porsche has confirmed the Taycan for India. For now, we can tell you just that though. On the timing of the launch, our guess is only around December 2020 or it might even get pushed to early 2021. Pricing will be well upwards of 2 crore rupees.
And that is all on today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did bringing it to you. Please join us next week. Please wear your seatbelts. Bye-bye.